What did an ancient Roman do on the toilet? Well, I'll spare you the obvious basic details, but a better question would probably be, what did Romans do after they'd been to the toilet? I'm here at Chedworth Roman Villa, a beautiful National Trust site set in a delightful Gloucestershire Valley, a quiet and fantastic heritage site. Behind me, you can see the low stone walls that mark the extent of the villa. And in the middle, there's a Victorian museum. I'm standing in front of the oldest toilet the National Trust possesses, a beautifully preserved Roman latrine. So this is a great place to come to think about toilets. And it's a topic that's been on my mind because I've just produced a four part podcast series for History Extra called Toilets Through Time. What I want to do is give you a few insights into how the art and act of going to the toilets has changed over the centuries in Britain. So I've come here to Chedworth to tell you a little bit about what I've learned from talking to a few historical toilet experts. And yes, such people do exist. If there's one thing that most people know about Roman toilets is that they clean themselves afterwards with a sponge on a stick. However, I learned while making the podcast that there's actually academic debate about this. Some experts contend that the sponge on the stick was not for wiping your bum, but rather for cleaning the toilet after you're finished. Presumably it wasn't debated at the time, and I imagine most Romans were very clear about the etiquette involved, and nobody stuck the sponge in the wrong place. According to Dr. Hannah Platts, the Roman expert I chatted to for the podcast series, if sponges weren't available, other wiping materials that might have come into play, including leaves, makes sense, clumps of moss, soft and moist, I guess I can buy into that, and broken bits of pottery. I am not so sure about that. If we think about the medieval period, the transport of moss into towns for this very purpose was big business. Fast forward to the Tudors, and moss was still an accepted tool for this sort of thing, but they also had a strange penchant for goose feathers, and also, and you won't like this, oyster and mussel shells, which surely must have scraped rather than wiped. By the time we get to the Victorian period, we're into the time of mass media, and yesterday's news was today's toilet tool. Newspapers stuck on nails were de rigueur for the 19th century. Roman toilets were often communal. You would have had benches around the side of a room, benches had holes in and below was a drain pushing away the water. Everyone would sit together, who would likely be sat within touching distance of the neighbouring occupant, there were no screens, and interestingly, as Hannah Platz pointed out to me, though the actual toilet experience was communal, it probably wasn't completely open to outside public view, as there would generally be doors or curtains before you entered the toilet. There were ways that that could be controlled, um, in terms of not once you were in there, sitting amongst others going to the loo, but so that control so that you weren't seen from the outside. So we do have evidence of doors um, as you enter into the toilet, um, the communal toilet, so that actually you could go about going to the loo, yes, amongst other people, but you wouldn't be seen doing that from people outside. So even though you were sat among friends while you went about your business, it was kind of a separate space. I'm imagining a what goes on tour stays on tour situation. Ah, okay, so James, um, what do you do here at Chadworth? I look after the visitor experience here. So I have the best job in the world, which is to bring history to life uh, and obviously bring the experience at Chadworth to life. So it is absolutely fantastic. And uh, this must be the the most popular bit of the visitor attraction, right? Absolutely. No, it is, it's, it's been brilliant. We, we put it in uh, about six months ago um, and it is the gift that keeps on giving. Everyone comes here, they inspect it, they wonder what's going on. Um, they pick up the sponge on a stick, they sit down and they all pretend to use it. And there's lots of smiles and laughter and photographs and then people share it like crazy. So yeah, it's one of our most popular items and, uh, and we love having it here. I've got to know though. Has has anyone tried to use it in anger? <laughs> Close. I had a. We've got a, a a team room which has a window, and we used to test it over there to see how it would work in different spaces. And I managed to peek out the window one day, and uh, there was a husband and wife that were coming along, and they thought that no one was around them, and uh, and the husband dropped his pants and and sat down <laughs> and started to use the sponge on a stick, and she was cringing and laughing at the same time. And uh, I didn't have the heart to knock on the window and tell them I could see it all. But uh, yeah, that, that was a very memorable moment. <laughs> As we move forward to the medieval period, there are still examples of communal toilets. In Ludgate Hill in London, for instance, there's a 12th century triple hole bench toilet. At Langley Castle in Northumberland, there's a latrine tower that has four stalls in a row with low stone screens between them and no obvious doors. Now, the question of what you should do in a communal toilet experience in the Middle Ages is addressed by a certain Daniel of Beckles in his Book of the Civilised Man. 
Dr. James Wright, my medieval expert, told me all about the advice that he gave. There are certain tracks which tell you that it, it is socially unacceptable to potentially greet your uh, your you, the people around you, your friends or, or your peers, etc. Um, for example, in about 1200, a fellow called Daniel of Beckles says... Um, a urinating man should habitually project a chilly silence, namely that you shouldn't be having a chat while you're actually going to the loo. But I think the fact that somebody's actually writing down this etiquette for, for going to the toilet does kind of indicate that perhaps people were having a chat. Because when you tend to get these, uh, the, the, these, missives as to how to behave in society it's usually indicative that the reverse has actually been happening in the tudor period communal toilets were still a feature of some places the great house of easement in hampton court had 28 seats over two floors there were no cubicles so you just go and see who was in there as tudor expert professor tracy borman imagines contrary to the advice of daniel beckles it might have been the place where gossip was spread and affairs of court discussed you would just sit there next to each other men and women there were no cubicles it was seen as quite a social activity actually. Oh, we'll just go see who's in the Great House of Easement today. Uh, and you sit there and, and have a chat and talk about the latest gossip of court, the latest events, and uh, and do your business at the same time. By the 18th and 19th century, private toilets were becoming more common, certainly among the middle classes, who embraced the flushing water closet. However, as my Victorian expert, Professor Jerry White, pointed out to me, there were still some communal experiences to be had. Constipation was a real issue and um, hence the sort of the popularity of spa waters in a, in a variety of... Well, there are many spas in London where there were some uh, spa waters heavy in iron. They're quite... Um, uh, how shall I say? They, you know, they, they make going to the loo easier. And there was a place called Bagnig Wells where... Uh, in near uh, King's Cross, which is in North London by one of the big railway stations. And um, Bagnig Wells was a notorious place where people would go, they would perch on a long pole, they would chat about what was going on, and they would wait for the spa water to take uh, its course. And um, in there was a rather amusing... Um, ditty, which was published, I think, in the 1760s, which talked about, you know, going to um, Bagnig Wells and where you could hear the thunder of the bum. Would there have been a thunder of the bum here in Chedworth in Roman times? Perhaps it would have been slightly dampened by the sound of running water in the sewers beneath the toilets. The Romans are well known for their prowess in water movement technology. Their sewers would have been perfectly designed to move the waste away from the villa site. There's a spring over there from which the water would have been channeled to provide a regular flow through this toilet in which the waste matter of the occupants of the villa would have been removed. You might think that they spent so much time engineering sewers because they were worried about the public health implications of being in close proximity to poo. Oh no, not so according to Hannah Platts. Sewers obviously provide a way to get rid of waste and they provide a way to get rid of a lot of waste. But it wasn't until uh, cholera epidemics of the, what, 1800s um, that really got people understanding about disease and bacteria and bacteria spreading disease. When we look at our Roman sources, we see them talk about the sewers with pride as a noteworthy achievement, as, as some of the magnificent works of Rome. But they also talk about what was removed as being the foul yuck of Roman society. And when you then ask the question of, well, did sewers actually help improve health and hygiene? Did they make the Roman world a, a healthier place? No. Because the Romans had no concept of bacteria or the diseases that bacteria uh, formed, encouraged. That only came around in the, in the 1800s. There was nothing done to stop the spread of disease through diseased poo, essentially. To reinforce that point, it's notable that this latrine is right next to the kitchen. And as far as the National Trust archaeologists have been able to work out, the only door into the place would have been via the cooking area. 
So there are some questions there about who was using this facility, but they certainly didn't make much effort to separate the ovens from the hors d'oeuvre. Anyway, back to that thunder of the bum I mentioned earlier. If there had been a lot of noisy flatulence going on in the toilets here in Chedworth, the Romans would probably have been pretty happy about it. Why? Well, apparently Romans perceived the health benefits of farting, certainly whilst eating. At least that is according to the Roman biographer Suetonius and his account of the life of the Emperor Claudius in the 1st century AD. Suetonius tells us that when Claudius heard about a man who nearly died from trapped wind, he supposedly passed an edict to allow flatulence at the dining table, either quietly or noisily. That's a surprising public health initiative. I guess that's one of the things the Romans didn't do for us.